comes from West Liberty, West Virginia here in Ohio County. While here, see places such as West Liberty and Wheeling. We'll also speak with David Javersack, retired professor of West Liberty University, and Frank O'Brien, director of the Wheeling, Ohio County Convention and Visitors Bureau, and they'll both give us a detailed account of some of Ohio County's history, culture, and area attractions. Virginia. Uh, people started coming into this area in the 1760s, 1776. It was uh, made a county. It was a very large county at that time, included what's all now the northern panhandle of uh, West Virginia. County seat was West Liberty, stayed the county seat for about 20 years, and at that time, the West Liberty seemed to be a safer uh, place. Uh, it was away from the river. It was away from some of the struggles that were going on. There are three major uh, battles of, between Indians and settlers in this region in the 1770s, early 1780s. Um, when that dissipated, and when the, the threat from the native population was moved further west, we moved the county seat from West Liberty to Wheeling in 1797. And at the same time, we started to divide up Ohio County. And so the northern parts, what are now Brook and Hancock, uh, became Brook County. And the southern part, what's now Ohio County and Marshall County, uh, were divided in, in 1797. Uh, that early period in the history of this area is resplendent with battles, uh, with Indian attacks on isolated communities. And it's a very, very vicious time. We estimate that maybe 1,500 to 1,800 settlers in that period will die as a result of these conflicts. Uh, men, women, children, we have no idea how many uh, Native Americans uh, died. But it, it's, a, it's a violent time because of the European settler who's coming in in effect, is invading somebody's homeland, and they're going to fight to try to, to keep that. And both of these societies are used to solving their differences by using force. And because it became so intense, it also became extremely violent. So this is the edge of the frontier. Uh, this was the furthest extent of the uh, new, really, American Republic at that time. And that's one of the reasons the town of West Liberty is called West Liberty. It's the western extent of liberty, which we were, uh, we were going through. And there are a lot of famous uh, events of that period. 1777 
is the first siege of Fort Henry. Uh, it also features the um, escape of Major McCullough down the, the mountain. And if you read the descriptions, you would swear that a horse had to jump off of a mountain. Well, if you know anything about horses, they don't jump off of mountains. They stop. They're, they're a little smarter than that. But uh, it, it, it is a, a, a feature. We still commemorate that. If you get up the top of Route 40, as it comes into downtown Wheeling, there's uh, McCulloch's Leap and there's the, the Mingo Indian uh, that's there. Uh, five years later, there's another siege here. It's, it's referred to as the last battle of the American Revolution. That's 1782, September. And that event is commemorated even today in Fort Henry Days over the um, weekend of Labor Day. And that's the one that features Betty Zane running between the house and the fort, bringing the uh, gunpowder to hold off the Indian attacks and, and so on. And that was made famous uh, by the American uh, writer Zane Gray, who has a relationship uh, to that family. But once that period of confrontation between Native Americans and Europeans ends, very quickly the frontier moves west. And by 1803, Ohio, which was just a frontier 20 years before, becomes a state. And it will rapidly become uh, by the time of the Civil War, the fourth largest state in the Union. And America moves west. Well, as America moves west, if you take a look at the map of where Wheeling, West Virginia is, and you draw a line directly west, you bisect the new states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. And when the American government decided that they needed to tie these new western areas into the already established East, they decided to put a new road to the West, which we now know as the National Road, sometimes called the Cumberland Road or the National Pike. Uh, Route 40 is, is now, and now uh, Interstate 70 follows basically the same route. Wheeling will have an advantage that most other places along the Ohio River won't have. It will be the nexus of transportation. You have a road that's coming west and that road crosses a river and by the time the road gets here we already have steamboats that can go up and down the Ohio River and as a consequence wheeling starts to grow. And by the middle of the 19th century, Wheeling will be the largest settlement west of the Allegheny Mountains. And because of its location, it becomes that jumping off point for north and south on the river, uh, east and west along the, uh, the road, and trade develops, uh, businesses will start to develop, and industry starts to develop. The earliest iron industries in this area began as early as the 1830s. And the one little product that will set Wheeling aside as a, a, a really developing and bustling place is only about two or three inches long. It's the cut nail made out of iron made here, and there will be people who, who come here in the 1840s and they are amazed at the amount of traffic along the road with these huge Conestoga wagons, freight wagons pulled by, you know, uh, several teams of horses. One man re reports seeing 20 wagons in a train going west full of nails. And uh, we estimate that the majority of houses built after 1835 till the end of the century 
throughout the Midwest, uh, all the way to the Mississippi River, were probably made from nails wheeling West Virginia, or at that time, wheeling Virginia. This is the nail city. That's why today, the amateur hockey, the, not the amateur hockey team, but the pro hockey team that's in town, is called the Nailers. I mean, that was a substantial part. And throughout the, the 19th century, we probably produced here uh, 50 to 55 million uh, ba barrels of nails. Well, if you can produce nails from iron, you can produce other kinds of things. So that industry will grow. And if it grows, then other things will come along with it. For example, you have all of those Teamsters coming through town, and they're driving wagons all day long, and they develop some bad habits, and one of their habits is uh, stogies. So this becomes an area for making uh, tobacco products. Uh, originally, they were stogies, which was, a, which was a long, fairly cheap cigar that were made in Wheeling beginning in the 1840s. Uh, there, there is still a company called Marsh Wheeling Stogies. They're now made in Indiana, which is kind of humorous in itself. Uh, but we had all kinds of tobacco operations in Wheeling. In fact, by the, by the 1890s, there are at least 50-some tobacco operations in Wheeling, making upwards of or using something like five million pounds of tobacco. And if you've ever picked up a leaf of tobacco, you know that that's not very heavy to have five million pounds. And uh, that's, a, that's a big market. Uh, later uh, goes into chewing back tobacco, mail pouch chewing tobacco, which is well known throughout the United States, uh, still made here in Wheeling in, in 2014. So you have nails, you have tobacco, and then you have other things to develop. Glass is going to develop. Uh, various kinds of foodstuffs will develop. Uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, Wheeling will be the most industrialized town in West Virginia. There will be, there will be more factories and mills in West Virginia than in Charleston, Huntington, Parkersburg, Clarksburg, Morgantown, and add a few more in combined. Uh, it, it's overwhelming the economic prowess that this city will have. It's one of the reasons it becomes the first capital of West Virginia. It's why until 1920 it's the largest city in West Virginia. It's why for years it would be the richest city in uh, West Virginia. And it all came very quickly. Uh, when, when you think about the time, the, the people who, who would remember the siege of Fort Henry in 1782 would still be alive when their town is a bustling community in the 1840s and the 1850s. Uh, in 1849, we put up the largest suspension bridge in the world at that time, the Wheeling Suspension Bridge, which is still used, which connected the uh, eastern shore to Wheeling Island, and then you can go across the island and then go across the back channel of the Ohio River. That back channel was much easier to put a bridge in because the water was so low. In fact, in, in the summertime, there wouldn't be any water in there at all. So they, they've had a bridge across that back channel since the 1830s. And it's in the same spot that the new bridge is. It's uh, maybe a difference of 20 feet. Uh, over the, over the years, and that facilitates the movement of goods and services. And then in the 1850s, we get the railroad. So we're pretty well set for all of that. And, and if you look at 
the centers of American life in the 19th century, the large states like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, we're smack dab in the middle of that. So we're strategically located. This would be, uh, by the late 19th century, the most uh, sophisticated city. It will have its own symphony orchestra, it will have music societies, it will have it all. And all within the lifetime of a couple people we move from colonial frontier to dominant city. The extreme northern part of the state is the part that will create West Virginia. Uh, and we're talking about uh, counties from Wood, uh, north along the river, from uh, Harrison up to Preston, Montgalia. Uh, those areas closest to the High River, uh, closest to Pennsylvania and uh, the state of Ohio. Uh, there's a very strong unionist sentiment. Now, if you go to the south eastern part of West Virginia, that had nothing to do with this, but those folks didn't go down there, they came to Wheeling. And they in effect um, did a fait accompli to the rest of the citizens of, of West Virginia. They were able to push through a series of actions which got the blessing of the uh, federal government through the Congress and the President, uh, passed muster with the Supreme Court that created West Virginia, and this is how they did it. They said, okay, because the state seceded, then we'll create a new Virginia called the Restored Government of Virginia. And they did that. And the, the capital of that was in Wheeling, down at what's now known as Independence Hall. Then the restored state of Virginia agreed to create a new state, which they, after a, a series of discussions, decided to call West Virginia. There were various other names, Kanawha, Augusta, Columbia, uh, Western Virginia, New Virginia, a whole, whole bunch of things. And we got people to agree to that. But if you look at the vote that was taken by the folks uh, for the creation of West Virginia, you'll realize that entire counties that, that now make up the state never bothered to vote. And out of a population of 376,000 people, the total number of votes, yay or nay, to create a new state was only around 21,000. So obviously, the majority of people who live with what is now the confines of West Virginia had nothing to do with it. The Senate of the United States approves the creation of West Virginia, but if you look at that vote, and you look at the number of abstentions from the vote, had the abstentions been added to the negative votes, it would have failed. And the people who voted for it are, were, are very, very practical. They, they, in effect, said, hey, what we're doing is something that comes in war, is not a precedent for other periods of time, and if the war hadn't been going as badly as it was in 1861 and early 1862, probably wouldn't have happened at all. And it certainly wouldn't have happened in any other uh, city. Wheeling dominates this part of the uh, Western Virginia. And as a consequence, you know, when you, when you meet here, you're meeting in a very safe environment. So then it should make, you know, it shouldn't surprise anybody that after the president decided, okay, uh, we'll, I'll sign this statehood bill, Despite the fact that the Attorney General of the United States said this is an unconstitutional action. And the President said, well, thank you, you know, Attorney General, but there's a political aspect to this. And West Virginia becomes a, a state, Wheeling becomes the capital. And it will be a capital on two occasions. Uh, 
until 1885, and then in 1885, the capital will move to Charleston. The, the first history that I remember reading when I was in college about the creation of West Virginia, and it's a title that I've used in some of my own writings, is the creation of West Virginia is a species of legal fiction. Economically, the, the dominant period in Wheeling's history would be about 1880 to 1930. Uh, although we can make the argument that it will uh, still extend into the 1950s, because if you look at even as late as 1950, there are more manufacturing jobs in the Wheeling, Steubenville, Weirton area than in Charleston, Huntington, Ashland combined. Uh, this becomes an industrial area. It starts in Wheeling. By 1921, Wheeling Steel has 21,000 workers. Uh, the city of Wheeling um, in the 1920s will have about 15,000 manufacturing jobs. Uh, we made steel products of, of any kind. We made uh, garbage cans, we made lunch pails, uh, we made tin cans, you name it. If it, made, it could be made out of metal, it was likely to, to come from here. And then, you know, north of us, you will also have a continuation of that with the development of steel mills and Fallensby and Weirton, uh, down to the south in, in Benwood and so on. Uh, you would know that you were coming into an industrial area if you were um, coming down river on a, on a diesel or, or steamboat or if you were flying in very early, you know, in the 1920s because you could see the smoke that was coming up. Uh, Rebecca Harding Davis, writing in the, in the 1860s, uh, calls the, the peculiarity of Wheeling as it's smoke. It's everywhere. This whole valley was just full of uh, industrial smoke from its steel mills and, and uh, so on. But when you, when you have the development of major industries like that, one of the things that it does is it spins off other kinds of activities. I mean, if you have people who are coming in to do work and they have to build homes, your construction industry will grow. One of the biggest unions in Wheeling in the late 19th century, carpenters, joiners, plasters, hod carriers. We used to have unions of people who carried hods and for the, the modern viewer who don't know what a hod is, a hod is a, uh, a little V-shaped thing on a big stick that you can either carry bricks with or mortar. And uh, there was enough activity that they had their own union. In fact, they not only had their own union, there were two of them. There was a white hod carriers union and a black hod carriers union. And as a consequence, uh, you had labor in this area. 40% of all the unionized labor in the entire state of West Virginia is in what Wheeling. Uh, there'll be like 4,000 union people here, and I think the next town, maybe Huntington, has a couple hundred, something like that. Because you have all these industries. You've got the tobacco that's growing. You, you've got glass factories. You've got tile factories. You've got furniture factories. You, you name it, we produced it here. Uh, there is a document available that, that lists all of the products that have been made in Wheeling over the years, and it is 11 pages single-spaced. Uh, and it's just, it's just amazing when you see all the kinds of things that, that went on here. Uh, planing mills, um, mills that would produce a stone block. If you look at uh, some of the major um, 
things in the area like the bridge abutments or the bridge towers or retaining walls. Those things were all cut locally. They were cut out of some of the stream beds here. Uh, you know, you have that kind of industry. Meat packing. We had a company in Wheeling called uh, F. Shank and Company that had its facilities out in Fulton by the creek because all the stuff that was left over from the slaughtering, they just dumped into the creek and let it float down to the Ohio and then let somebody else deal with it. But that plant, uh, even, even as late as the 1920s, that plant alone had 400 workers. Uh, the March Wheeling Stogie plant at one time had 600 workers. The male pouch chewing tobacco had 400 workers. I mean, it's just amazing. This was a town that produced stuff, stuff that, that people used. And people across the United States would be familiar with Wheeling or parts of uh, the northern panhandle because they were using products from here. They were smoking them or chewing them. Uh, they were the, the lights in, you know, their chandeliers or um, with their glassware. You know, you, you had people producing uh, uh, glassware that will be at the centennial celebration. And if you watch Antiques Roadshow, the, every once in a while there's a piece of um, that glassware that will show up. We actually in Wheeling developed a process for, for developing various kinds of glass. And then remember, not too far to the north, uh, the Homer Lachlan Company becomes the largest pottery in the United States. But you also have the Wheeling Pottery. You have the Wheeling Tile Company. You, if you could imagine the product, it's being made here in Wheeling. And as a consequence, one of the things that it does is it draws in uh, people who are looking for opportunities. So you'll have people who will come in from the rural areas of the state and adjoining states, but you'll also have the immigrants who will start to come in. And in the uh, mid-19th century, that's German. And as a consequence, not only will Wheeling be different because of its industrialization, but it will be different because of the large German population that's here and its German newspapers, uh, it, its German grocery stores, its German uh, butcher shops, the German brewers. So if you have all of these people coming in and you, you come from a uh, society that as happens in Northern Europe, drinks beer, it shouldn't come as a surprise that one of the other big businesses in Wheeling is brewing. And by the beginning of the 20th century, the two largest brewers in the state of West Virginia are within a mile of each other in Wheeling. The Schmulbach Brewing Company and the Ryman, or, or sometimes pronounced Raymond, Brewing Company. And what's interesting is if you go out to Greenwood Cemetery, their funeral statues, which are quite large, look at each other. <laughs> and, um, but you're talking about these guys produce 350,000 kegs of beer a year. And that's only two of them. There, there were smaller brewers in here. There were, at the beginning of the 20th century, something like uh, maybe 200 different taverns in West Virginia. Well, if you're brewing beer, then you have to have the other things that go along with it, where your bottles come from, so you have to have bottle companies. Where does your power come from to do the brewing? Well, you have your own coal companies. And you, uh, how do you get your beer to market? So you have to have your own Teamster companies. And all of that grows. Well, as that's growing and you have this concentration of people, then you need a transportation system. And one of the consequences of that is that Wheeling will have one of the best systems of streetcars of any state, any city in the state 
any city in, in the United States. There'll be 135 miles of streetcar tracks here. That's added on to the railroad. You, you start to bring in these other uh, Europeans, <clears throat> the Polish, the Italians, Hungarians, Lebanese. And as a consequence, Wheeling and Ohio County will have a larger concentration of foreign-born Europeans than almost any other county in West Virginia. That's why they have an Italian festival here. That's why you'll find churches that were uh, St. Stanislaus, Polish Catholic Church, or St. Alphonsus, German Catholic Church. You'll have a Maronite church from Lebanon. Uh, the Northern Panhandle, particularly from Ohio County to Brook and to Hancock, uh, their ethnic differences, their Catholicism is really much different than the rest of the state of West Virginia. Like everything else, nothing lasts forever and in the industrialization of the Northern part of West Virginia has diminished greatly in the last really 50 years. Although the more I have studied it, uh, I realize that the changes started even earlier than that. The last time the population of West Wheeling will increase is 1920. Um, it peaks in 1930, but in 1920, Wheeling added its outlying communities uh, by annexation, places like Warwood, Elm Grove, Woodsdale, Fulton, Leatherwood, so on. That's what made the population of Wheeling grow. Had it not been for that, the population of 1920 would have actually fallen below that of 1910. By 1920, Huntington, Charleston will outpace Wheeling. One of the reasons for it is that by that time, we don't have any more expansion. One reason is that there's no more area to grow. You can't expand in areas that are already filled up. And as a consequence, uh, other areas in West Virginia will start to grow. The, the major industries in Wheeling, particularly steel, will continue to grow through the, even through the Depression into the 40s because of the war and into the 50s. Some of the other industries, however, uh, will start to lose. Notably glass. A lot of the glass factories will be gone by World War II. Two, one of the things that does glass in is the need for uh, large amounts of fuel, uh, either gas or coal or what have you. But also, as the population of the United States increases, and as you move into other areas, they develop their industries too. And as a consequence, maybe they don't need as many of the products from Wheeling. Also have to keep in mind that we, we start the globalization of the economy earlier than, than a lot of Americans think. I mean, I can show you a uh, editorial from the local newspaper in the mid-1930s and the essence of the editorial is how can some of the local businesses, particularly the, um, those that manufactured uh, cloth, like the uh, J.L. Stifel Company, how can they compete with foreign competition? This is 1937, okay? Now, once World War II is over and Europe starts to rebuild, and Japan starts to rebuild, those areas start to put in or rebuild their steel capacities. Also, after World War II, we get into different kinds of products. We start to use aluminum. 
And just south of Wheeling, they put in a huge uh, aluminum plant, uh, or met, interestingly, it's now closed. Uh, we developed uh, different kinds of, of things like plastic. I guess the one product where you can see that what the change will do to steel industry is the automobile. Take a look at the, the front and rear bumper areas of automobiles. They're plastic. The quarter panels probably around the front uh, and rear wheels, they're plastic. That has an impact on steel. Go to the grocery store and see how many of those aisles are filled now with canned goods as opposed to goods that are either frozen or are packaged in some kind of uh, box or plastic. You know, we don't think about those convenience packaging much, but it has an impact on those kinds of jobs. I'll give you another for instance. As the automobile gets more popular in the 19, in the early 20th century and certainly by the mid century, we start to phase out things like streetcars. Well, when you start phasing out streetcars, you also phasing out uh, the companies that make tracks for steel, you know, the steel uh, tracks, uh, or the steel cars, or anything else like that. Remember those 135 miles that we'll have in the wheeling, they're all, they're all going to be gone. Now, if steel production starts to decline, you shouldn't be surprised that there'll be declines in things like certain coal production, because a major component of steel is coal because coal is made into coke and coke is the major ingredient in the making of iron. Well, what if that all changes? What if you don't bring in all of the ore that's necessary to make iron ore? Maybe you don't need all of those cars that were made out of iron and steel. And that has a, a rippling effect. And then keep in mind that overseas, you have steel companies that get developed in Japan, in Europe. Once the Chinese uh, finally get some stability in their government after the communist takeover in 1948, they start to make their own steel mills. The Russians make their own steel mills. The South American countries like Brazil, they make their own steel mills. And as a consequence, beginning really as early as 1945, the percentage of American steel production uh, in terms of its world percentage starts to decline. And that decline will pick up uh, into the 50s and into the 60s and into the 70s. But even as late as 1960s, Wharton still, still has about 12,000 employees. In 2014, they've got maybe 900. There are no blast furnaces left in any part of this area. Wheeling steel or wheeling pit that will take over for wheeling steel really doesn't exist anymore. All of that stuff has been uh, taken down. Take a look at things like glassware. Look, see where it's made. How much of it comes from the Czech Republic or Poland or Thailand? Take a look at China. We used to, we made a lot of China in this area. But take a look at how much China is made in China or Taiwan or Malaysia. You know, very little of that stuff is, is made here. Take a look at decorative tiles. You know, you go down to a home improvement store and you look at the tile, where is this made? It's made in Brazil. It's made in, in uh, Asia someplace. You have an internationalized economy. 
we buy products that are made everywhere. You know, the one constant in history is change. Things do not stay the same. Change can be good, change can be bad, change can be indifferent, but there will be change. And we move forward. basic attractions that I think appeal to the large uh, mass. Ogilvy Resort is actually a city-run park system, which makes it extraordinary. However, the, the city basically lets the park commission run it like a business. And we have a four-star resort right here in Wheeling, West Virginia, that offers everything from uh, some small, a little bit of skiing in the winter to this incredible Festival of Lights uh, tour, which is uh, in excess of six miles that, that draws a million people a year every winter. Uh, and then during the summer, there are indoor pools, outdoor pools, three golf courses, uh, 272 rooms, 50-some cabins. So it, it's an extraordinary, uh, beautiful environment. They have flower gardens, and people just really rave about it. I also believe that we have one of the best waterfront venues anywhere on the Ohio River. Uh, we have it, and we call it Heritage Port and through a partnership with the National Heritage Area Corporation and the city of Wheeling, they were able to build this beautiful amphitheater on the waterfront. Uh, and we have everything from wine and jazz festivals to blues festivals, stern wheel festivals. Uh, we have the Upper Ohio Valley uh, Italian Festival. Uh, we have a, a multicultural festival. We have arts commission festivals. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. In, in fact, we even have uh, vintage hydroplane boats that actually come here and, and demonstrate races. So uh, I would estimate that anywhere between 350 and, and 450,000 people attend the multi multiple events at the waterfront. We also have destination retail. Um, Cabela's uh, has it located here. And from an economic uh, standpoint, they also added a million square foot distribution center also at the Cabela's location in Ohio County which their target audience is internet sales so it created a lot of jobs plus we have the showroom and once Cabela's came several hundred other businesses popped up and and uh, and so it, basically that's a high concentration of restaurants retail destination retail and and hotels uh, we have a federal building called independence hall today which is actually a free state-run museum and has a collection of civil war battle flags from both the north and the south that it really in my opinion is second to none and they are in temperature controlled environments and cases so they will have a, longe a longevity and people can come and see them uh, also where they had the great debate as to whether or not we should change and whether or not we should leave Virginia that took place in Wheeling as well and you can still go into that courtroom and, and you kind of, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a ghost believer or anything like that, but you can certainly feel like something important happened in this so place. Another important tourism driver in Ohio County uh, is Wheeling Island Racetrack and Casino. Uh, they have a 151 room hotel over there. It's on the island actually. And there are a couple thousand people that share the island with, with the casino. But this casino is actually a Greyhound dog track. Uh, which is kind of extraordinary. There are only a few of those in the whole country, and you get to see these beautiful greyhound dogs race, uh, and, and, and it's just an extraordinary opportunity. And they have a, a family section, obviously, so they can see their races. But they also have a, a full-class, full-service, Vegas-style uh, casino with all the table games, all the, the slot machines, all the types of things that would attract you. And it's done in a Caribbean motif. When you open up the front door, there's this big giant waterfall that is the first thing that you see. So it really, you're in Wheeling, West Virginia, but it feels like all of a sudden you're in the Bahamas. Uh, in 1928, 
uh, there were so many successful entrepreneurs and business people living in this community that they wanted to bring the world of entertainment and the and things that they that made them go wow in their world travels to their fellow citizens here in Wheeling. So a couple of local businessmen built this extraordinary uh, Bow Arts Theater that seats currently 2,200 people, uh, and and it cost a million dollars in 1928. And thousands of people went, there were 15,000 people that went to, to see a silent movie that day, multiple times, obviously. Uh, and the world of entertainment that was going on everywhere else, like Paris and Rome, and that these men had visited, was now in Wheeling's community. The theater has been in constant operation f since then. However, in 2007, its previous owner closed the venue and when it closed, we took an immediate economic hit. Uh, whenever there was a, con a consistent show at the theater, people would come to Wheeling, see the show, spend money in restaurants, stay overnight, uh, buy gasoline, go to the, the grocery store. And whenever they closed, the econo negative economic impact was to the tune of a million dollars a month in November and December. So our agency, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, conducted a survey to determine how negative that impact was. And so what we did is, after we determined that we were losing way too much money, we put it out there. We did some feasibility studies, we did engineering studies, and we offered it to the general public hoping that a private investor would step up. Um, there was some interest. However, there was nobody that had basically the vision or the money to bring it back to life. So being a 501c6, we're a nonprofit, uh, private nonprofit, uh, we were able to enter into partnerships with the National Heritage Area Corporation, the city of Wheeling, and we purchased the theater. And it was closed because it had 28 public safety violations. And some were simple, some were like an extension cord running under a carpet. Others were elaborate, like a fire escape that was not adequate. So I, uh, as the CVB, convinced our board of directors that not only should we buy it, but uh, we should upgrade it and reopen it and, and, and make it a viable, sustainable operation. So we went to a local bank and borrowed $1.6 million, which was enough money to purchase it and bring it up to code. And once we brought it up to code, we reopened in 2009. And now I'm proud to say that as we continue to operate, now the private sector is stepping up uh, in the form of donations. We've recently had a foundation donate to us uh, $600,000 to help us replace seats. Uh, a man and his wife, a wonderful uh, industrialist, donated $200,000. Uh, so we've been able to uh, upgrade all the seats, brand new seats inside, new theater uh, carpeting, new theater curtain. We now can show movies like we used to do back in the 80s. Um, right now we're doing a facade stabilization and repair uh, a project, which is a combination federal program as well as uh, a national heritage program. And it's all about partnerships. Um, we have, Wheeling is one of 30 some nationally designated uh, areas based by the federal government. And basically what that means is uh, um, the government believes that what happened in Wheeling is so important to American history that some of it should be sustained. And so through their efforts and our efforts and, and, and the city's uh, Sports and Entertainment Authority, we were able to get the theater back in operation. So the deal is the historical renovation part of it is handled by WINAC. The operating of the theater is actually run by the Sports and Entertainment Authority, which runs West Banco Arena right beside us. So they, they have all the ushers, they have the ticket takers, and the people with the skill sets to run a theater. And I'm, I'm, we've averaged around 57,000 people come to shows every year. It's also the home of the long-standing Wheeling Symphony, which is uh, in its 80th year. Uh, so we're really proud to have a sustainable venue that works. It's generating positive economic impact, and, and, and it's all come together primarily because of partnerships. And quite often, um, politicians or people have a tendency to tell people everything they're going to do. 
uh, we did a lot, and then we told them what we had accomplished, and then we asked for a little help, and they came. And one quick example, when we first bought it and wanted to clean the walls, we put out a, a request for volunteers, and more than 180 people, just regular, uh, regular people, off the street, maybe anybody that had ever been to the theater in the past, they came and we uh, cleaned the whole building on with volunteers. And we had uh, these really nice ladies that would hand wash each one of the chandelier crystals. I mean, it was just an amazing, amazing feat. And to see it open and to operate and create an economic impact, um, it's a dream come true for us. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, it makes Wheeling exceptional is, is we have a major east-west artery running through the uh, downtown part of, uh, of our city, and that's Interstate 70. Uh, an estimated 150,000 people per day, or drivers, or vehicles rather, uh, travel this highway. Uh, so we have a great opportunity to get them to come off the highway and visit our, our great community. And to do that, uh, we obviously have to market. We, we market from everything from billboards to electronic media, Facebook, um, websites, television, radio. So it's a pretty active campaign because we think that what we have to offer is certainly worth the visit.